Good morning, everyone. Yeah, eh. My name is Raquel Black. <clears throat> I am the co-working manager for Chain Slabs. Um, those are my clans, and I'm the member of the Navajo Nation from Shanta, Arizona. Uh, so thank you all for being here with us today. And then first off, I'd like to give a brief introduction of Chain Slabs for those of you who are here for the first time and don't really, um, or who are not entirely familiar with what Change Labs does. <clears throat> First of all, we are a native-led, uh, Change Labs is a native-led and native-controlled nonprofit organization based on Navajo and Hopi nations. Our goal and our mission is to provide a creative workspace, tools, resources, and knowledge for native entrepreneurs. How we accomplish our goals and mission is through our different programs. <clears throat> Uh, we have the co-working program, our business incubator program, and our kinship lending program that we actively um, accept members and support members with. Our research arm called Doing Business. Uh, we are based in Tuba City. Chain Labs um, programs were developed to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem on the Navajo and Hopi Nation by affecting societal norms on how Native populations perceive entrepreneurship, um, highlighting role models, building a network of peer and mentorship support and developing leadership capacity of participants and growing that community of entrepreneurs. Here we have our mighty team that helped make Change Labs a great organization that it is today. And we have Jessica Stago, Heather Fleming, who are also our co-founders. Heather is our executive director, director as well. We have our business, um, I'm sorry, our financial director, Marsha Grayeyes, our incubator director, Cecilia So. And then with that, with her team, we have Holly Patterson, Tim Deal, and Joe Elliott Nez, who are um, incubator coaches. And then we have our kinship lead, kinship lending director, Christine Laughter, and her teammate is Swarovski Little. He's one of our newest um, teammates. And then we have um, Leon, who also helps with a lot of planning for um, our local chapters that we have in our area. To talk about a co-working program, construction is done on our new headquarters, which is located right next to the Tuba City Chapter House on Main Street. And I'm so excited because that's where I will be based at. Um, for those of you who are not entirely familiar with what a co-working space is, it's a community space for business owners and entrepreneurs to help to use to help um, operate and manage your business. <clears throat> This space in particular will serve our native entrepreneurs and small business owners, especially those based on the Navajo and Hopi nations in the Four Corners area. So later this year, meaning next month, we will have a brand new co-working space available for you to use. And some of the services we'll be able to offer are tools that could be useful to your business. Tools such as desk base, Wi-Fi access, color printing, um, in-person coaching sessions, and a lot more. We will also have space available to rent. So if your business needs a meeting space, I know that's something that's really, really rare on the res, <clears throat> having a professional setting, a quiet setting, a private setting for yourself to operate um, your operational um, parts of your business. So running your meetings, um, accessing Wi-Fi and desk space to just set up and do your work. Um, we also plan to bring back monthly in-person trainings for those who are interested, and our list of co-working services is constantly being updated as far as how we plan to support our local entrepreneurs and small business owners there at the new um, headquarters. And we're always open to new ideas on how we can better service our local community. So if you have any ideas on, or suggestions on how this co-working space can benefit your business, definitely let us know. <clears throat> we're really excited to bring this community space for everyone to help with building and growing your business. So please stay tuned for more information as a construction or a construction is done as we get closer and closer to opening, uh, which should be very, very soon. This is a picture I was able to get a couple of months ago before um, the majority of our construction was done. And as you see the beautiful rainbow, and we took that as an extreme, extremely wonderful blessing for ourselves. And we're really excited. If you go to our Facebook page or our YouTube page, we do have more pictures on there too that you can see of the building. Moving along. <clears throat> One of our most popular questions that we get here at Change Labs is how do I start a business? All of our programs and services here are designed to help our native entrepreneurs and artisans, our local vendors, and those who we like to call change makers because that's what our local businesses and entrepreneurs are, you're change makers. Um, so if you're a native entrepreneur, small business owner yourself, 
please know that you're absolutely crucial to our local economies and Change Labs is here to help you both start up and strengthen your businesses. And now for a brief overview of the Business Incubator Program. It's one of the only Native-led business incubators for Native entrepreneurs in this country. And we're based right here on the Navajo Nation and the border of the Hopi Nation. This program is led by our Director of Business Incubation, Cecilia So, who's online here. Good morning, Cecilia. And starting this year, um, it's a six-month program for Native entrepreneurs. Hi, Cecilia. Hi. Who wants support on training, how, um, training on how to start and operate your business. So if you're interested and would like um, assistance with things like your logo and website design or how to set up and maintain your bookkeeping and finances, please visit our website for more information at nativestartup.org slash incubator, or you can send an, in a message to Cecilia right now. She's online right here. Yes, uh, and I'll throw my email in the group chat. Thank you so much, Raquel. Cool. Awesome. And then... Next is another question we get often, how do I get help running my business? There are so many aspects of being an entrepreneur and the answer or solution that you may be looking for may not always be obvious. <clears throat> Here at Chance Labs, one of our driving factors is kith, kinship and building that relationship among our community and the members and our nations and how Chains Labs can help there is through our business coaching appointments. We offer free virtual 90 minute appointments with any of our business coaches. Our coaches are available on Mondays from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and they each have their own area of expertise depending on the kind of support you're looking for. <clears throat> we have a team of very, very bright and eager coaches. They are each incredibly knowledgeable in their specialties and we'll be able to assist you when, where you're needing help with your business. Uh, the coaches are able to assist you in areas from marketing to accounting and bookkeeping systems. Or if you're just starting out, they can assist you with creating a business model or navigating the Navajo Nation system for things such as your business site lease or registering with the Navajo Nation business regulatory. <clears throat> uh, this coming Monday, we don't have um, any appointments available just because it's a holiday. Um, but if you go online to our website at nativestartup.org slash events, you'll see the available dates that we have. We have our coaches like Christine, we have Cecilia, um, Holly and Marsha, and they're all really, really great, great to talk to. And uh, it would be a really great starting point for you if you have any questions on how Chains Labs can help your business. Another question that we get here at Chains Labs is how do I create a website? Until Chains Labs can go back to opening um, studio hours at our HQ in Tuba City, I will refer you to our YouTube channel. We currently have over 50 recorded sessions and discussions all designed for native business owners <clears throat> and led by other native entrepreneurs or creatives and um, others in our, no our network who really just wanna see our native people and their businesses thrive. Um, we have covered topics like social media marketing, website design, doing business on the Navajo Nation and a lot more um, to access any of our past sessions, including this one um, later on once it's uploaded. Uh, you can go to our YouTube channel Sorry. <laughs> and another great resource we have to offer are our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And I do recommend that you check those page out, pages out for regular postings and updates, especially for postings on the building and our grand opening. There's a lot of pictures and updates there. And lastly, there's a whole spectrum of who we consider or who are considered native entrepreneurs. And here at Chains Lab, we've been curating our own list of them. If you're in the market for finding other native service providers <clears throat> or product makers or, um, and others who can help you with your business, we have over 600 native owned businesses listed here that we think are really, really great resources for starting and running your business. Or if you're looking for a native made products, you can visit the site here at resizing.org. And if you have any questions at all about Chains Labs, or if you're interested in any of our services or getting in connection with any of our coaches, feel free to send me a direct email. Uh, my email is raquel at nativestartup.org. I'll put that in the chat as well. And, or you can visit nativestartup.org, our Chains Labs website. All right. <clears throat> now, before we get started with our guest speaker for today, I do want to touch on our workshop etiquette and how we can be respectful of our guest time today. We do ask that you stay on mute during the presentation unless you're called on, but please feel free to populate the chat box with your questions just so we don't forget questions and then we'll make sure to get to them before they, we end the session today. Another reminder is our session is being recorded today and will be available on the Chainslap YouTube channel later on this week. 
All right. And now introducing our guest for today, Amber Phyllis Parker, CPA. <clears throat> Amber was born and raised on the Navajo Nation. She's of the Towering Health people. Oh, we're sisters. Woohoo. And for um, born for the One Who Walks Around clan. Amber is a licensed CPA in the state of New Mexico and has over a decade in accounting, field managing financials <clears throat> um, from $2 million to $132 million. Uh, Amber resides in Farmington, New Mexico with her family, and she's grateful for the opportunity and experience um, to use her experience and her skills and expertise as a CPA to provide accounting services to her many, many clients. Uh, she is an indigenous woman owned, or Phyllis Parker and Associates is her company. It's, a, it's an indigenous owned woman, indigenous woman owned accounting and operated accounting firm. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Providing remote keeping, um, bookkeeping, accounting, and tax services to small businesses and entrepreneurs throughout the U.S. Um, she's going to be talking about the pitfalls of operating a small business, small business financial pitfalls of operating a small business, and how we can avoid them. So, before I chop up any more of that, I'm going to turn the time over to Amber. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Amber. I will let you take over. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, um, today's presentation is, oops, they did it again, a financial pitfall alert. So, Yat Ev, Sha'e, Amber Hillis, Parker, Yenesha, Sha'e, Kiani, Nishla, Hanagakni, Bashish, Chin, Nakarinet, Adjashit, Che, Sotsotni, Dashinala. Hello, everyone. I'm Amber Hillis Parker. I'm of the Towering House People Born for the One Who Walks Around. I was born and raised on the Navajo Nation. I'm a licensed CPA in the state of New Mexico, and I have um, over a decade experience in the accounting field. I've managed financials um, from two, $2 million to $132 million. And my passion is really rooted in seeing my dad run his business. Um, so... Before we get into the pitfalls and the financial um, aspect of that, I'd just like to share my story and provide some insight on who I am and where my passion came from. So this is a picture of my dad and a picture of myself when I was young. Um, my dad was an electrician and he had opened up his business, um, Hillis Electric, where he um, wired houses across the Navajo Nation. So his goal was to help provide electricity to businesses and individuals across the Navajo Nation. And he was my first real introduction to business. Um, we would, um, my sisters and I would go out and help my dad pull wire or strip wire or just do little things for him that would help him within his business. And um, I learned a lot from seeing my dad be an entrepreneur. I saw what work ethic was. I saw um, how much time and effort he put into his business. And I later found out that um, my dad had ended up closing his business. And when I got a little bit older, I had asked him what had happened. And he had mentioned to me that he had wished that he had a good CPA on his side. And that was the first seed that was ever planted um, was by my dad. And at a young age, it was, what is a CPA? Um, what did they do? How, um, if I had a skill set, how would I be able to help my dad? And that really um, impacted my life. Um, to see my dad work through his business. Um, so that leads me to the path I kind of chose. So I went into, uh, I went to school at Fort Lewis College and I graduated with a double major in accounting and finance. Um, I went into public accounting and I pursued my uh, getting my CPA license. At the time, I was a single mom. I was working full time. I was studying. So the journey to becoming a CPA took a total of five years. And I share this experience with you all because um, 
it was a hard process and to not give up on the things that you want in life. Um, I spent countless hours studying. I would get up at four o'clock in the morning and study before having to get my little girl ready for school, take her to school, work, bring her back, you know, do the mom stuff and then study again. And I spent weekends and I spent holidays and I did everything I had to do to, to earn my CPA. And through that process, not only I think did it give me the tools to better serve clients, but it also instilled in me the discipline and the ability to know how far I could push myself in order to achieve the, item, the things that I want in life. So over here on the right-hand side, I'm getting my certificate. Um, and being a CPA has really opened up different doors of opportunity for me. I've been able to be an auditor and work with tribes and um, government agencies. I've been able to work in healthcare and as a controller, work in schools as business managers and run accounting departments. Um, so I have a, a range of experience in seeing different businesses through the life of their business. Um, but it really wasn't until um, 2021 that I made a pivot. Um, me and my husband, we were having a little girl and she came early. So she came 10 weeks early was not a situation that I was thought I was going to be in. Um, and my little girl spent 47 days in the hospital. Um, sorry, but it was, uh, it was very hard to see your little child go through so much at such a young age. But it gave me an opportunity to really evaluate my life and what I was doing and the contributions that I was making and whether or not I was really living up to um, my full potential or wanting to give back to the community. So it was that time that I wanted to, I wanted things different. With my oldest daughter, I was a single mom, so I missed everything and I didn't want to do it again. So that is how Hillis Parker and Associates came about. I knew that I had this skill set and this passion to help others because I saw what my father had went through. So I created Hillis Park and Associates and we do bookkeeping, accounting and tax for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, we are indigenous owned and operated accounting firm. We're based in New Mexico, but we provide services across the US. And our mission is really to ensure the longevity of businesses through financial integrity while empowering business owners over their finances. Um, I'm a firm believer in the work that we do is really to set business owners on a path of longevity. Um, and that's through having accurate financial statements. My firm belief is that financial statements are the foundation to any aspect of your business. If you want to grow, um, if you, you know, need to make a determination on something, it's really going to go back to your financial statements. And at the firm, we're firm believers in not just presenting you information and here's the stack of paperwork and this is your um, financial statements, but really sitting down with you and discussing with you what these documents mean. What is, what is, what is your financial reports? What's the story it's telling you? And that's where um, we really believe that there's power um, in empowering our business owners. So before we get into the presentation, I have to do a general disclaimer. So this material has been prepared for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide or should not be relied on for tax, legal, accounting advice. You should consult your own tax, legal, or accounting advisor before entering in any transaction. So the goal of this presentation is really to um, review six common financial pitfalls for entrepreneurs, tips for avoiding these pitfalls, and to overall improve your financial 
management awareness and to increase your chances of success. So when we think about where everyone um, on this call, either you're thinking about starting a business, you've either started a business or you've been a couple of years in your business, right? You're well established. But what you're doing is entrepreneurship. And when we look at what the definition of entrepreneurship, it is the activity of setting up a business or businesses taking and taking on financial risk in the hope of profit, right? I think that this definition is so important because nowhere in the statement says that it's going to be easy that it's a foolproof, um, everything is gonna go right, and everything that you do, you're gonna make a bunch of money, right? What this is saying is that you're taking on a financial risk. Um, you're putting in time, money, effort, and at the end of the day, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, you're really hoping to have profit, right? So how do you approach financial risk in the hopes of profit? And in my career, in my business, I would really some, um, come up with, I really see these six areas as downfalls, as pitfalls for entrepreneurs. And regardless of where you are in your entrepreneur journey, journey this might apply to you right now. This might apply to you in six months, a year. Um, some of these aspects may apply to you, you know, not for several years, but I want you guys to have an awareness of these pitfalls so that if you're seeing that you're struggling in some areas, um, we'll give you some tips on how to get out of this or make corrections. So we're gonna be looking at um, poor record keeping, mixing personal and business expenses, um, not having financial reports, underpricing products and services, not planning for taxes and failing to pay attention to cash flow. So um, if there's any questions that you guys have, please put them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. But for number one is poor record keeping. So what is record keeping? Record keeping is maintaining one's history of activity um, and entering this into ledgers, journals, files. Um, so it's really just about tracking what has happened. And the IRS says that you have the burden of proof. So anytime that you put an expense um, on your financial statements and carry that to your tax return, um, the burden of proof is upon you. There are certain elements that you have to that you have to prove in order to show that it's deductible. If not, you could be in a position where uh, taxes are assessed on you with penalties and interest. So, record keeping it is important. And what I see when it comes to pitfalls of poor record keeping is that you're unable to monitor the progress of your business you are unable to prepare financial statements, you're unable to identify sources of income or profitable lines of revenue, you're unable to track uh, deduction, deductible expenses or track bases in a property or a business, and you're unable to prepare tax returns. So some tips to, um, to implement is, use an accounting software. Um, there's tons of uh, accounting software out there. Some of the common ones are QuickBooks and Xero. If you're just starting out and um, QuickBooks or Xero is a little bit too expensive for you, you can start tracking expenses on an Excel spreadsheet. Also, you want to keep your receipts. Um, I know that um, people have the perspective of, you know, having a shoebox and throwing all your receipts in there. Um, well, that can work. Uh, receipts fade. So keeping them electronically is going to benefit you. You can use some software like HubDoc. HubDoc, I believe, is like $12 a month. 
and it helps you keep all your documentation. You can set it up where you can push uh, receipts to QuickBooks. Also, um, if you don't have the budget for that, you could also just take a picture and um, save it in your Google Docs. You could also just scan and download it to your personal computer. Um, so for anyone that is like barely starting out, it's so important that you get into the habit of doing your record keeping. So on a daily, weekly basis to go in and look at the charges that you've made in your account and make sure that you have a receipt saved for all of that. Um, if you want it to go a step further, you could definitely hire a bookkeeper who would manage the record keeping aspect of your business. Okay. So number two, mixing personal and business expenses. Um, a lot of people don't see how monumental this could be as a pitfall. And so they use, you know, the same bank account or credit card for both personal and business. And with the corporations, LLCs, and partnerships, you must keep them separate. And for individuals that are just starting out, you might be a sole proprietorship. Um, it's recommended that you keep them separate and you do this for accounting and tax purposes. Um, some of the pitfalls that I see is that it's an increased scrutiny from regulatory agencies. A lot of times I see that um, when an audit happens, such as like from New Mexico State, they're wanting to see all transactions in your bank account. And now you're having to go back and prove whether or not um, funds that you've received are really uh, personal versus business. Um, so say that you're, um, you went on a trip with your family or friends and they reimburse you, right? You might receive $500 or $1,000 reimbursement from your family members or friends. Now you're having to prove to these agencies that, hey, this is not business income. This is personal income. And if you're not doing proper record keeping where you actually know uh, the situation around that transaction, now you're probably going to be put in a situation where you have to pay higher taxes with that. Um, when you're commingling funds, it makes it difficult to track business transactions. A lot of times I see individuals that um, haven't done record keeping and we're trying to get them up to date. And now you're trying to uh, remember what happened a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. And that just makes it difficult to really um, with full confidence say that this is a true business transaction. So um, it also will lead to mismanagement of funds. So if you're mixing business and personal, you could overspend and you can underfund key business activities. Also, you know, incorrect, inaccurate financial statements means inaccurate taxes, right? Everyone wants to put so much emphasis on taxes, but there's so much stuff that you have to do in the forefront in order to have correct taxes. Um, also, you could be undermining the credibility of your business. I have talked to individuals or even bankers where they're trying to give someone a loan, but they have no financial statements. So they ask them for their bank statements. And in this document is many transactions that are not related to the business. And it really under, undermines the credibility of the business if you don't, if you're mixing commingling funds. And from a legal perspective, like piercing the corporate veil, um, for entities that are legal, are supposed to be legal um, entities from themselves, like a corporation, an LLC partnership, when you're commingling funds, you now open yourself up for, um, open up risk related to your personal at, uh, assets or even your business assets. So say someone is suing you personally um, and you've been commingling funds, um, they can go and say, well, the business is not separate from them. So whatever assets the business has, I want, I want a piece of it or vice versa. Um, the business is getting sued and you're commingling funds, then your personal assets could be on the line as well. So 
business tip, go out and get a separate business bank account, credit card account, and just run your transactions through there. Use an accounting system to track these expenses um, and don't include your personal account in your accounting software. I see this way too many times. And what situation you might get into is now your banker or your you're trying to get uh, send off financial information. Now you're trying to explain to them, oh, this is like my business bank account. And um, it's just a messy situation. So don't include your business, your personal account in your business software. Establish policies and procedures. Um, and these policies and procedures should go over what's an acceptable business expense. How should you be reimbursed if you paid for it personally? What are um, different areas that, how do you get reimbursed? So not only establishing these policies and procedures, but also communicating to your staff, uh, to your employees, anyone about these policies and procedures. Also, review these transactions on a regular basis. Um, there's a lot of times where um, individuals accidentally swipe the wrong card. You know, they're buying something from Walmart and they pull out the business card. Um, and if you're not tracking this and doing record keeping and reconciling your books, um, you could easily still trans have uh, the business pay for personal expenses. So just develop a process where you're reviewing these transactions on a regular basis. No financial reports. Um, this is huge. And this is like the biggest thing that I see um, in my practice. So financial reports are to provide clear and accurate picture of the company's financial performance. Financial reports includes your income statement. Um, some people call it the P&L or the profit and loss balance sheet statement, uh, cash flow statement, and other financial metrics. Um, the pitfalls with these is that if you have no financial reports, you don't know what condition your company is in. I see, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, well, I made X amount of money in revenue, but revenue is one portion of it. It really comes down to profitability. Um, it comes down to liquidity comes down whether or not you have enough money to cover your bills. Um, and financial reports will help give that information to you. I've seen many times where people have missed out on opportunities or they're in a standstill because they don't have financials in order to give to a banker to secure a loan in order to buy a building or to upgrade their um, equipment. They don't know if whether or not they should hire someone, they can afford someone. So a lot of times people are like in a standstill because they don't have financial reports. Um, they're unable to see potential risks or threats. Um, financial statements will give you a good idea of, of where your business stands with that. Um, if you have no financials, it could mean that you're non-compliant with fi um, financial reporting for different entities or investors. Um, you're unable to get financing. Um, if you don't have financial reports, you're overstating or understating revenue and expenses, which ultimately goes back to taxes. So financial statements are, are so important. Before you think about taxes, you need to think about getting strong financial, accurate financial reports. That's like the number one thing. Um, so tips related to financial reports, keep accurate records of all income and expenses. This goes back to record keeping, implement an accounting software, hire a professional, an accountant, um, schedule a time each month or a quarter that you're reviewing your financial reports and make the necessary adjustments. Seek to understand financial statements. Um, if you have a really good uh, bookkeeper or accountant, they're going to sit with you on a monthly or quarterly basis to go over your financial statements. They will tell you how to read these statements and explain the story to you. Um, so when you're looking for someone, make sure that they can help you in these areas. Also, you could implement dashboards or analytics to monitor financial performance in real time. 
um, and really understand what reporting requirements are required for your business. Um, financial statements are like a book. It, it tells you a story. And as long as you can read it and you put effort into reading it, you could be proactive. You can change your financial situation. You can maximize um, the situation that you're in, but everything really comes down to these financial reports. Number four is pricing products and services. So of course, I'm pretty sure you guys all know, you know, you don't want to be too high. You don't want to be too low. You want to rather reflect the value of the product or service, right? Sounds super simple, but it's really hard. Um, if you're underpricing, uh, it impacts sales, profit, and brand. Um, sales is not always an indicator of success, right? So if you're selling something for $100, but it takes you $150 to make it, um, you're a negative $50 each time you sell that. There is no profit that it brings to you. Um, so pitfalls. So if you're not selling your product at the price that is beneficial, you're unable to grow or sustain the business over time. Also, if you're pricing too low, it could have a perception of low quality or less valuable. Um, also, you have to be able to cover your production costs, your marketing, overhead expenses. Um, it sounds like an easy process, but it's hard to do. So the tips with this is, I really encourage you guys to test different pricing strategies. There's different strategies that you could use on how to price your products. So like costs, plus pricing or value-based pricing, um, dynamic pricing. There's all these different ways that you can price. And it's really going to be contingent on like the product and service and the industry that you're at. Um, this goes back to like researching the market and really identifying your target um, audience. Are they price sensitive? Do you only have this target audience for a certain point in time? Um, also, you know, when you are looking at pricing, you have to consider all your costs. So it's very important to go back to like, are you record keeping? Do you have financial statements? You'll be able to really have a good grasp on all the costs. Um, if you have financial statements, you'll be able to identify your profit margin. Um, and this is like the big one here is be open to reevaluating your prices. A lot of people think, oh, you know, I had it's a price that I said, and um, I don't want to change it. I don't want to. Um, I don't want my customers feel to feel like I'm, you know, taking advantage of them. But at the end of the day, if you're not pricing right, you're not going to be there for that customer long term. So don't be afraid to reevaluate your price. And also to individuals that are selling a service, if you're the one selling the service, know your value. You have a skill set that took a long time to develop. There's knowledge that you've gained. So you paid, you spent time and energy gaining this knowledge. You've had experience. There's time and energy that went into that. And also, you know, who you are makes you different. So really know your value and what you're bringing to the market. Um, I always like to think like, you know, know your value, then add tax. <laughs> Speaking of taxes, so one of the pitfalls too, and this one probably hurts the most for a lot of um, entrepreneurs is not planning for taxes, right? So not really considering the implications of business decisions. What does it mean if you purchase this building or this vehicle? What happens when you sell it, right? It's not about just making the decision on operational activities, but also looking at the tax side of things um, and not preparing for tax liabilities. This is, this is huge for individuals that we see. Um, tax planning helps you, um, if you're not tax planning, then you could be missing out on deductions or credits that could reduce your tax liability. 
some of the pitfalls with this is simply with a lot of new um, new business owners and even people that have been around for a while too, not really fully understanding or knowing what taxes apply to them. Um, and also not planning for taxes can put a significant uh, financial burden on you. So not only the liability that you would have to pay, but a lot of times you get penalties and interest on top of that. And it could be very significant um, for you and your business. It could also cause cash flow issues as well. So any, um, any cash flow problems, you're going to have to take money from the business and pay these taxes. Also, I think the biggest thing is like stress is anyone that I talk to about taxes, it's always a stressful matter. It's, um, it's something, it's a very complex um, subject. And also there's a lot because that there's that unknown aspect of it, income um, stress, right? And anytime you're stressed, not only does your business feel it, any staff employees, but also it affects your family life too. So as new business owners, um, how many taxes do people think there, there, um, there are out there? Maybe put in the, the chat box, how many different taxes you think you might get as a business owner? Navajo Nation tax, absolutely. Five plus, absolutely. So as business owners, what knowing what taxes apply to you and your financial situation um, is really dependent. And it's dependent on several things. And these are just a couple, right? So it depends on what type of tax entity you are. Are you a sole provider? Are you a corporation? Are you an S corp? Are you a partnership? Uh, what type of tax entity you are, what products or services you're selling, where you're selling them, where you're making them, where you're selling them. Also, the revenue that the business is generating and the profit that the business is generating. So a lot of people only think of income tax. So number one, income tax, like federal and state taxes, because that's the, the one that you're most um, familiar with. So this is going to be like your when you have your W-2s or your real estate income, um, you're going to be doing your 1040, and that's your income tax on a federal and state level. But also, as you're an entrepreneur, you might get hit with self-employment tax. If you have employees, you might have payroll tax. Um, depending on your product or service and location, you will have to deal with sales tax or gross receipts tax. Um, and if you're not passing these taxes to the end user, it's a reduction in your revenue for the business. Property tax. So if you own a building or um, any type of fixed asset, you might have to pay property tax. Even if you don't own this, but say that you're renting a space and in the contract, it says that you have to pay um, you have to pay the property tax. Now you're paying the property tax. If you sell certain products such as alcohol or tobacco, you might be having to deal with an excise tax. In certain states, you are you have to deal with franchise tax on the business side. Um, you have to pay into unemployment tax. And then just depending on if you sell an asset at a gain, you might be dealing with capital gains tax, right? So in your business, there's all these scenarios that could happen where you could trigger taxes um, in one way or another. And sometimes, and a lot of times, um, individuals are not really knowing what taxes really apply to them. And um, if you don't know, then you're really not putting yourself in a position to save for these taxes or to pass these taxes on or to factor these taxes into your pricing. So some of the items that you can do is, you know, it goes back to, again, financial statements, keeping track of deductible expenses. If you can deduct that expense, it could possibly lower your taxes. 
um, being proactive. So setting aside 20 to 35% of your revenue for income tax um, and putting this into a separate bank account. So this account should be, so if, this is an example, if you're banking with Wells Fargo, not to have this bank account with Wells Fargo, go to your local credit union and save this money in here. It shouldn't be easily accessible. Um, if any of you guys want to read a good book, Profit First um, goes over this concept as well. Calculating and paying um, quarterly estimated taxes. If there is one thing that you could do to really alleviate the stress at the end of the year would be to set aside the money, but then to calculate and pay these quarterly estimated taxes. Um, they really alleviate stress at the end of the year. And also working with, uh, um, do, doing some tax planning with a professional and no social media. If you're getting your tax planning advice strictly from social media, um, I encourage you guys to talk with a tax professional. Um, over this tax, this past tax season, we saw a lot of businesses implementing different tax strategies, not really fully understanding what they're getting themselves into. Um, and a lot of times they, they are valid tax strategies, but you need to understand the proper steps of implementing them um, and the consequences of implementing them. So if your main source of tax advice is coming from social media, please reach out to a tax professional. Another area that I really see um, with individuals that are not uh, planning for taxes is when it comes to November, December, January, now it's this push to figure out how they're going to handle their tax situation. And a lot of times when individuals are in a situation where they're going to have to pay taxes, meaning that they have profit, now it's the scramble to spend money, right? To spend as much money as they can in order to not show a profit. But there's two sides to this, is that you really should be purchasing um, items that are going to generate you money. So instead of just going out and making, um, trying to get an expense in there at the end of the year, uh, making sure that what you're spending money on is really going to generate you revenue. And what I see a lot too, is that individuals um, do what they can to lower their taxable, their profit. Now they go into first, first quarter and they have they have no cash and they can't pay um, payroll. So make sure that you're doing some sort of tax planning and having financial statements will really help you be in a position where you're able to make a better decision. Number six, so failing to pay attention to cash flow. So depending on where you are in your journey, um, this is gonna be It's going to be managing your cash flow should be a number one priority. Um, so what's cash flow? Cash flow is the cash that the business generates or uses in its operation. Um, so basically it's the movement of money in and out of your business. Um, and really understanding what decision, understanding the activities that you do and how it affects your cash flow is going, to, is going to give you a lot of information about your business. So if you're not monitoring your cash flow, it could harm re your relationships with your vendors or suppliers. If you're not paying your invoices on time, uh, this, can, this can really harm relationships. Also, if you're not able to meet payroll, um, this could cause a sense of instability within your company. Um, so we know, the individuals that are um, that have employees, we know that our employees are our assets, and you never want to put them in an environment where they're wanting to jump ship because they don't know if they're going to be paid or not. So, cash flow, um, not paying attention to it, can 
cause an unstable environment. Also, you could miss opportunities. There might be a situation that you can do an investment or you have an opportunity to expand or improve or make a new product. But if you don't have the cash flow to handle that, you're missing out yet on another opportunity. This could influence your poor credit rating, um, could make it difficult for you to obtain loans or financing, um, puts you in a situation where you're making poor decisions, puts you in situations where you're dealing with legal issues. Um, so if you're, you have any unpaid taxes or bills, um, you might be dealing with a legal um, issue which costs time, money, money and energy. So here's the tips for um, cash flow management. Um, if any of you guys do not have a cash flow budget, I would highly encourage you guys to work on one. Um, this is really going to plan out what expenses and what income you're expecting over the course of a year. Um, it's very beneficial if you implement it and you use it. Um, also, maintaining a reserve account. So you should have anywhere from three to six months worth of expenses in an account. Um, and this is not including the tax account as well. So you should have your tax account where you're going to save for your tax reserves and then just three to six months of other expenses that you have. You will need to monitor your accounts receivable. Um, a lot of times people are not really managing what is owed to them. So anytime that a payment is overdue, you need to contact that client or that customer and ask them to pay. And also there's ways that you can encourage timely payments. This could be with offering a discount or, you know, implementing a penalty. Um, individuals that are dealing with inventory, this is going to be, cash flow is huge for you. Um, you could use something like a sales forecast to really help you manage your inventory so that you're not um, overstocking and all your cash is in your inventory or um, trying to purchase items and then they're out of stock. Also, you want to control expenses. Um, if you have the opportunity to negotiate any prices, take advantage of that. What's the worst that they could say is no. Um, reduce unnecessary overhead. Um, a lot of times I see individuals um, in situations where, you know, it's just $50 a month. Oh, it's just $100 a month. It's $20 a month, right? But over the course of time, and as you move in your business, these little um, $20, $50, $100 start adding up and they really can affect you. Um, and also look at your expenses. What are, you know, going back to, are your expenses bringing in revenue? A lot of times people get caught up on the shiny new object syndrome, right? You might see something, someone is um, trying to sell you a course, right? And this course is going to answer all your questions and make you so much money by in a week. And, you know, all these shiny new objects are just um, ways for you to be distracted. And what I've experienced is a lot of times um, shiny new objects will eat your money up and they don't really help you that much. So really when you're trying to make a large decision on what to invest in, take the time and really research that. Don't get caught up in, um, it's this one feature that's going to solve all my problems. Um, consider financing options. So is there a line of credit or a loan to cover cash flow shortages? But please like be cautious of this. Be cautious of taking too much debt. If you're doing a cash flow um, budget, you should be able to calculate these costs in there to see whether or not you really can sustain um, covering the payments back. And with your cash flow budget, it's not enough just to make one, but you have to go back and review and adjust this and update it based on actual results. Okay. So 
that was a lot of information, right? That's a lot of information to go over and um, to really be hit with all these scenarios that are, you know, a little bit scary, right? So let's kind of recap what we've talked about. So we talked about um, poor record keeping being a pitfall, mixing business and personal expenses together, so commingling, having no financial reports, underpricing products and services, not planning for taxes, and failing to pay attention to cash flow. So the biggest area that I see is that when anyone comes to me and they're in a position of, um, of scarcity or they don't know um, what to do with their business, it really comes down to either is seeing one, two, and three in their business. So I either see that there's no record keeping, they're mixing their business and personal expenses, and there's absolutely no financial reports. So what you can really do in order to help you is to either, you know, hire someone, an accountant, bookkeeper, to do the record keeping and the bookkeeping aspect of that. Um, if it's something that you feel very comfortable doing, do it yourself until you get into a position where it makes more sense um, for you to spend time um, running the business instead of doing like the, the inside jobs. So working with a really good accountant can set you up and really benefit your company. They can help um, do the bookkeeping and help you do help you produce financial reports. If they're really great, they'll sit with you and go over these reports with you and give you recommendations and um, give you insight into what they see. Um, financial reports will also help you correct any pricing discrepancies that you have. You have these reports that could really combat um, your pricing. Also, once you have these financial reports, then you're able to really work with a CPA or a tax professional with doing some type of uh, planning for taxes, right? And also, again, with having financial statements, you have the outline to do uh, a cash flow budget. So looking at financial statements, there's a process of the cash flow in there. But this is really, if there's any area um, that I would really highly encourage you guys uh, to do is either, you know, reach out for help if, when you guys can hire a bookkeeper accountant, definitely invest your, your money in that. And all of these items build on each other. So let's recap um, some of the tips that were provided that I really think that where you, wherever you are in your stage of business, if you can implement these, I highly suggest that you work on this. So save your receipts. I know that it's tedious and it's not, it's not fun. Sometimes it can be time consuming, but save your receipts because it will pay dividends in the long run. Use an accounting system. Um, choose an accounting system that you think is going to be best fit you, your industry. Um, get a separate business bank account and don't commingle your funds. Really seek to understand your financial statements. Um, review your pricing. Um, be okay with going back and changing your pricing. Um, and I even encourage you if you in your business, if you start out in a direction um, and you want to pivot, pivot. If you say you're going to sell X, Y, Z and you see that it's not taken off the way that you like and you've done your time and effort for that, don't be afraid to pivot and move in a different direction. Have a cash flow budget. Double check any advice you hear on social media. Um, that's a big one. Know when to ask for help. Um, as an entrepreneur, you're everything. You're, you're HR, you're IT, you're the salesman or saleswoman. Um, you're all these, all these aspects of the business when you first start out. And really know when to ask for help. Um, Change Lab is a great resource for that. 
Um, also pay your quarterly estimated taxes and file your taxes. Um, it's amazing how many um, business owners that I've uh, met that haven't filed their taxes. And again, it puts them in a situation where they're not able to grow because they have no um, tax returns to get funding with. Save 20 to 35% of income in a savings account for your taxes. And in the beginning, you might not be able to hire or outsource items, but um, when you come to a time that you're able to, or the op opportunity cost is high, then hire a bookkeeper, accountant, or a CPA to help you. And I think the biggest tip that I could leave for everyone here when it comes to entrepreneurship would be to take ownership, um, be accountable, be proactive, and be committed to achieving the success. If any of these areas scared you during our discussion, take ownership and either ask for help or dig into this information. The success of your business is really contingent on you. So I really encourage you to take the ownership there. Um, so we'll just leave this time for any questions. Here's my contact information. All right, so we have someone who raised their hand. Hello, good morning, Amber. Hi, good morning. Good morning. I do have two questions. I'm actually starting my bookkeeping um, oh, business cool. on the nation. I have mm -hmm. two questions um, pertaining to some of my clients. I have a few in the tourism industry. Um, um, most of them are from the Antelope Canyon area and the Page Lachii community. So what happens is Navajo Nation um, collects $8, so that's their permit fees. The tour companies collect the fees on behalf of the Navajo Nation. So it's now currently basically tour season for them. So on average, they're paying, they have like 500 customers for the month. So they're already giving um, Navajo Park and Rec $4,000 for the month of fee. How can I, like, I feel like I we should go back and charge them for that because they're paying, they don't have people collecting that $8 fee from Navajo Nation. It's the company owners that are doing that. I feel like it's wrong. Um, what's your take on that? Um, I've actually met someone who has went back and negotiated um, a percentage of it because they've collected it. Uh, so... Um, I don't have her contact information right off the top, but um, when it comes to, I guess, taxes and um, fees that it takes, um, it's just part of business, right? It may not be something that we like to do, but also this feeds back into our economy, especially being on the reservation and that this uh, natural resource is being used and it's in essence, you know, our contribution back to, to the nation or to this agency. Yeah, because so. I prefer to like maybe, I wouldn't mind giving that $4,000 for the month back into the, their community chapter or some sort of nonprofit organization, but we're basically doing their work um, the, well, the company is doing their work. So I, I'm just kind of like, I'm trying to do my own research on that and why they're, why it's like that. So um, the second piece is, again, in that area, it's a tourism town um, with Chi'i and Page Local. But when you go to their restaurants, they automatically charge an 18% service charge on top of whatever you get billed for your meal. And I feel like that is also illegal because we should make the decisions of how much we should tip the services but uh, that town itself I get the receipts and I'm seeing it and they do an additional char additional 18 percent charge it seems like on average when I'm looking at that is that can they do that yes they can do that um, but I know that it has to be clearly communicated okay 
um, question. <laughs> okay. And also, you know, for other agencies like um, uh, New Mexico, um, paying, getting New Mexico GRT, right? It's a cost that we pass to the end user, um, but we, we have to remit that, right? So same situation with collecting the $8. Um, it's just part of business and something that we have to do. Um, so we could say the same scenario where we're doing the work of collecting the funds, but it's, you know, it's just part of business there. Any other questions? Hi, Amber. Uh, this is Clarissa Friday in Wisconsin. Oh, hey. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, my question was, um, Again, I'm just a newer business two years in. And one of the questions I have is like the payroll or like, cause I have my separate account, but there's probably been one or two times in the year where I forgot my card or like the hell if I'm using my business card to like buy groceries or what would be the best way to like utilize the money or like to pay yourself or what does that look like? Yeah, so, and you're a sole proprietor? Um, it's set up as LLC. Yeah, so as an LLC, you would take a uh, owner's distribution. So you could cut yourself a check. Um, I've seen a lot of people when there are situations where, you know, they accidentally swipe the business card for a personal expense. That goes back to classification inside of your, your financial statements. So classifying that as a owner's uh, distribution is uh, what you can do with that there. But also, um, I've also seen situations uh, where the IRS has said, you know, where a distribution um, or a contribution into a company, if that really didn't hit the bank account, then they frown upon that. But I mean, we're talking like high, high dollars here. But um, you should be taking a uh, distribution from the company just for services that you provide it. Um, so kind of looking at it as your quote unquote payroll. If there's an instance where you accidentally swipe the business card for a personal expense, I've even done that. Uh, when you go to um, in, enter that information into your accounting system, just make sure that you're labeling that correct. So either as a uh, owner's um, distribution. Does that answer your question? Yes, that does. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize I wasn't on mute. <laughs> I can hear my screen. Well. Hello, um, my name is Sahar. I have a question. So I'm looking to launch a mini Airbnb empire in an area. My question was about, um, like from a tax perspective, would it make sense to file or register my business under both Navajo Nation and state of Utah? Or that's, I kind of don't understand that part and I feel like it's kind of hairy. Yeah, so is the Airbnb going to be on the Navajo Nation? Yes then you would have to do that. Um, you would have to register both. Um, so some people like to go first through the state. So going through like um, Utah or Arizona or New Mexico and filing with the state first and then turning around and filing with the Navajo Nation. Um, the Navajo Nation is a little bit more of a difficult uh, process, like you have to have your um, business plan and have a address on the reservation and other things like that there. But definitely you would need to do that as well. I would, um, uh, because the process for Navajo Nation takes a while, and sometimes what I've heard and what I've seen is that it's uh, a lot of the tie-up is related to the tax portion of the Navajo Nation going ahead and filling out, I think it's the Form 100 um, on the Navajo Nation Tax Commission website and, and submitting that so that they have that information on file 
um, before you start doing your paperwork to be uh, a foreign entity for the Navajo Nation. Does that answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I see that there was a uh, question about the book. The book is called um, Profit First. So I would definitely look at that. It will really change your thought process about um, profit and accounting for that first. Any other questions? Hi, I have a, well, that's, I guess it's a question. <laughs> Um, so I've been in business for about a year now um, with my salon, and it's been really, really difficult to find a bookkeeper or a record keeper, um, a CPA. I had one, um, but she just kind of stopped returning my phone calls and emails. And so is there like a place that we're able to find resources? I mean, I know Change Labs is a resource, but like, is there a place where there's like just an abundance of um, bookkeepers and record keepers, CPAs that we can choose from? Is that even a thing? Because I feel like um, it's really difficult to find people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know that a lot of times in like different groups, so if there's like a entrepreneur book, uh, group on Facebook, um, it's really easy to ask people suggestions in that as well. I know that um, the Roan Horse group started their own, um, what is it, Center Native that you could research as well. Also, um, I don't mind connecting you as well to some people that are specific to your industry as well. So um, if you want to just shoot me an email after this, then I can give you names of some individuals that I know are specific to your niche. Does that okay. help? It does. I, I mean, I appreciate that because um, it's just been really difficult and I've been trying to do my best at record keeping, but it, it's sometimes I just don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that goes back to, you know, when price is not always, shouldn't always be the determination of who you pick. It really goes back to communication style, um, whether or not they have experience in the industry that you're in. Um, and then, you know, you have to like the person. If you don't enjoy working with them, that's, you know, it's, it makes for a hard relationship. So I would say definitely, you know, reach out. Um, I can give you some names um, to some people that would be able to help you. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions? Amber, is the book that you mentioned, is that the one by Mike Michalowicz? Yes. Okay. So I put the title in the chat for everyone. It looks like it's yeah. available on Amazon and it's available on Kindle. If you listen to the audio version, it's pretty interesting. He um, is a character, so. All right, any more questions for Amber today? Or any last remarks or comments? Thank you so much that, like there are so many questions that you have that you don't know that you didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So um, I appreciate you for creating like very clear and concise um, slides and that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we're here, we do accept new clients. Um, if we're not a good fit, we definitely have the ability to um, pass your information to other people as well. Um, the, being an entrepreneur is, um, is a fun, exciting, um, adventure in your life and just partner with the right people that can really support you. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Amber. Thank you so much for all that really, really great information. Um, it does reinforce a lot of what Chains Lab teaches to a lot of our cohort members in both the incubator and the kinship lending program. And thank you for sharing your story. I know it's a, a really big privilege to hear, um, especially our entrepreneurs and our small business owners, like to hear their stories and hear their experiences. And thank you for sharing that. Um, I will share my screen one more time. And I don't have a workshop coming up again next month. What we do have are some virtual events leading up to our grand opening. <clears throat> uh, 
um, those the information for the grand opening virtual events will be posted um, online and on our social medias very soon. So keep a lookout for that. You'll you can check out our website nativestartup.org slash events. It'll be posted on there. Or you can send me an email if you'd like to uh, receive an invite so you don't forget about it. <clears throat> I can add you to my email listing whenever we have an um, online workshop coming up. Uh, one of them will be a panel discussion about decolonizing banking and how um, there are different challenges and experiences that uh, Native entrepreneurs have to go through to access capital. And the starting of that discussion on how we can remedy it and make it easier for our entrepreneurs to gain capital and <clears throat> to strengthen their businesses with them. Another discussion we have is our How We Did It panel with our co-founders, Jessica and Heather, um, Jessica Stago and Heather Fleming. They will be discussing how Change Labs came to be to now, especially in terms of our building. I know it's a really, really difficult process to get a brick and mortar to get space to operate your business. And Heather and Jessica will be sharing all the challenges and experiences that we went through as Change Labs to acquire that space and the plans for um, future spaces for Change Labs. And then we also have our grand opening event, which is going to be June 16, um, Friday, June 16 in Tuba City. Our building is located right behind the Tuba City chapter. So if you want information on that, send me an email as well, or you can check out our website, our social media platforms. We will have more information posted on there. <clears throat> if you'd like an invitation, definitely send me an email as well. I can get you added to our listing. And then, yeah, that's all I have for now. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. We are just under time, and I look forward to seeing you at our next um, virtual or in-person event. Have a great day, everyone.